Tonight, the search for survivors after a flash flooding emergency in Western Virginia. The new images coming in of roads and homes washed away. Dozens of people missing, including children and some residents without clean water right now. Storms also bringing raging floodwaters to Tennessee and this home in Maryland split in half by a tree. More storms in the forecast along with millions of Americans now bracing for dangerous heat. Also tonight, inflation hitting its highest level in 41 years. The cost of natural gas surging almost 40 percent. Food, housing and electricity also up with many Americans struggling to keep their homes cool this summer. Is this a sign inflation peaked or will the cost of living just keep getting more and more expensive? COVID's new strain, experts calling the BA5 variant the quote worst version of Omicron yet, saying it's vaccine resistant and more transmissible than any other version of the coronavirus. What health officials are urging for summer travelers. Crime closing businesses, 7-Eleven encouraging its Los Angeles area stores to close for a second night as a manhunt continues for the suspect behind a string of deadly armed robberies. This, as a spike in crime is also forcing Starbucks to close 16 of its locations on both coasts. What's going on? Growing shark warnings. A surfer hospitalized after he was bitten by a shark off New York's Long Island. Several shark attacks reported along the eastern seaboard in the last two weeks. Why experts say they're becoming more frequent. And Yellowstone shut out. TV's most popular scripted series not receiving a single Emmy nomination. So what could be the disconnect between viewers and the TV Academy? Top Story starts right now. And good evening. We start tonight with a state of emergency. The search for dozens of people in Western Virginia after dangerous flash floods swept through that area. New video tonight showing the devastation. This is Buchanan County, where more than 100 homes are damaged or destroyed. Roads and bridges cut off. Boil water notice is also in effect. And in Tennessee, more than 400 people evacuated from a campground outside of Knoxville after severe storms brought more than eight and a half inches of rain. That same system also packing dangerous winds, knocking trees onto several homes in Maryland. Widespread power outages now reported in several states. Let's get right to Issa Gutierrez, who's tracking it all for us. Tonight, desperate search and rescue effort underway in Virginia. At least 40 people, including children, still unaccounted for after severe storms tore through Buchanan County overnight. And it was just horrendous. The sky just opened up. And there it was. Residents describing the destruction left in the storm's wake as a war zone. The governor declaring a state of emergency. More than 100 homes inundated. Some ripped right off their foundations. This home carried more than 300 yards away by the rushing waters. We're sitting at this post office over here. Next thing you know, a house dinner is floating on down through there. Cars tossed around like toys piled up on top of each other. From the sky, the rural community, a sea of brown. On the ground, first responders still unable to get to the hardest hit areas. A lot of roadways are blocked by landslides, uh, bridges. Uh, the approaches to those bridges are washed out. Um, so it's going to take time for uh, that access to be restored so that we can get in. In Maryland, the powerful storms knocking down power lines, sending trees crashing into homes. This house in College Park split in two. And in Sevier County, Tennessee, torrential downpours causing the river to overflow as campers slept on its banks. One of the vehicles we had was underwater. The inside of the car had six inches of water inside. Back in Virginia, shelters now being set up for residents as rescue efforts continue. We were saying no families left behind. With no fatalities yet confirmed, a community remains hopeful. Isa Gutierrez, NBC News. All right, we thank Isa for that. With more thunderstorms possible tonight and millions of people under heat alerts from the southern plains all the way to northwest, I want to bring in meteorologist Bill Cairns. Now, Bill, walk us through what Isa was just reporting on there in, in Virginia and West Virginia. Yeah, the pictures we saw, the drone video over the creek, and it shows the town. You can see the foundation of the one home that was just washed away. So this is Pilgrim's Knob. That's where the video is from. And here's the border between West Virginia and Virginia. So this is in the mountains. It doesn't take a lot in the hilly areas when you get thunderstorms. So it started, look at all the lightning flashes. 
Texas here. This was 7 p.m. last night, and this was all the water coming down. At about an hour and a half after that, the National Weather Service issued their first flash flood warning for the area. They said one to two inches of rain had fallen. They were expecting another inch and a half at least, and you could see the bullseye right over the top of Pilgrim's Nod there about 9 p.m. Then they gave an update at about 10 p.m. Police were reporting that many bridges were washed out and that it was almost impossible to get around the region. Then after that, about midnight, the rain stopped. In all, it was estimated between four to eight inches of rain in a very short period of time. I, I got to ask you, just because you mentioned the National Weather Service, were, were people there caught off guard? Were they taken by surprise? Uh, it was pouring and the warning came in. With flash flooding, you get, it's not like tornadoes. They don't really know what's coming ahead of time as much. So they did have warnings. It was during the event, um, but being on a small creek in a valley, where were they going to no, go? Nowhere to go. Okay, we're also talking about the heat tonight. Bill, walk us through that. Yeah, so as far as the heat goes, we still have all the humid air being pushed up. Austin, Texas, by the way, hit 105 degrees today for the fifth day in a row. I mean, this has been some unprecedented heat in Texas. Tomorrow, 103 in Dallas. And how about our friends in Salt Lake City? We don't think of them as being a hot spot. They've been well over 100 all week long. That continues tomorrow. And guess what? It just goes on and on and on right into Friday. 102 Dallas, Salt Lake City, 101 Del Rio, 104. And into the weekend, you guessed it. I mean, we're easily into the hundreds in much of Texas. And Tom, I was looking at some of the data for Monday and Tuesday of next week. There's a few spots in Kansas or Oklahoma that could top 110. 110. All right, Bill. I know you'll stay tracking all that. We appreciate it. Now to something else that's incredibly hot, and that's inflation. The rising cost of living in the United States. The rate of inflation in June ballooning to 9.1% over the same month last year, the highest peak since 1981. The data spells a gut check moment for the Fed as it weighs more interest rate hikes. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has that story. For anyone struggling with daily expenses, especially seniors on fixed incomes, today's inflation report is not just an economic stat, it's very real. The highest inflation in 41 years. In Delray Beach, Florida, the cost of electricity to keep the AC on is crushing 66-year-old Veronica Bolig. She just received last month's bill, but she's already a month behind. The total bill was $592.11 for two months. $592. Veronica has a disability and is raising a granddaughter after her own son's untimely death. My Social Security is not getting any higher, but my bills are getting higher and higher. Too high. I didn't mean to do this. Veronica, among the tens of millions of Americans struggling with ballooning prices for just about everything. The cost of housing, shelter up 5.5% in one year. Electricity up 13.5%. Natural gas up almost 40%. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner is more expensive. Food up 10.5%. But this is where inflation is really biting. Gasoline in June cost nearly 60% more than a year ago. Oil up almost 100%. In Maryland, Alex Nielsen runs a landscaping business with 45 employees. He says this summer he's spending $3,000 more each week for fuel and oil. You've gone from $1,000 a week in fuel costs to $4,000? Yeah, the price of mix uh, of oil, bar and chainsaw oil, 50-50 um, mix for the weed whackers and the blowers have all gone up. Um, the price of diesel, everything's gone up. Now forced to pass a fuel surcharge onto his customers. There is some good news. Gas prices have now dropped 38 cents in a month. The hope? Inflation may have peaked in June. There is no question that we still have work to do. The Fed is going to say, oh my goodness, we've got to stop this snowball from getting bigger and bigger and turning into avalanche. All right, Tom Costello joins us now. And Tom, I do want to point out to our viewers that last voice we just heard from in your spot there, Austin Goolsby, an economist who worked in the Obama administration. And I say that because we're not necessarily talking about alarmists here. We're talking about economists who have worked with both administrations. The Fed Reserve is expected to raise interest rates yet yeah. again this month. And that's part of a bigger, bigger interest rate picture. How much higher are rates going to expect it to go? Yeah, and I should say, Goolsby is very concerned, very concerned about what's happening here, despite the, the drop in the gasoline prices. Listen, the Federal Reserve now expected to raise rates by another three quarters of a point in two weeks. And now because of this news today, this hot inflation report, probably another three quarters of a point, maybe even one full percentage point in September. Listen, as it relates to mortgage rates, the Federal Reserve doesn't set mortgage rates, of course. That occurs in the bond market, but it is influenced. The mortgage rates are influenced by what the Fed does 
And as you know, they are likely to move up if the Fed raises rates uh, even more. If you're in the market for a house and a new mortgage, you may want to lock in right now, Tom. All right, some good advice there. Tom Costello, we thank you for that. As Americans struggle to keep up with rising costs, I want to bring in a small business owner who knows this all too well. Riz Lacoste, she's the owner of the restaurant Riz in the West End section of Washington, D.C. Riz, talk to me. Well, what are some of the biggest cost increases you're seeing? Oh. And I know you just heard that report from Tom Costello there. I wanted to have you on because I know you're living this with your business every single day. Yeah, I, I think a small business is so difficult to keep control of and keep track of, just like a family is a small business. Um, we have to watch every single price. Um, we've been here before, maybe not exactly here. We will get through this, but we have to do it together. And I think the most important thing is COVID put us to, to a screeching halt. We all got off of the treadmill, and now we have to see where we've landed. We have to be very careful about spending every single penny. Risk, Prices, but talk to me, talk to me about your day to day. I mean, what's most expensive for you right now and, and how are you changing your business to stay stay ahead? Well, I'm changing my business by having half of the staff that I used to have. We're ex asking our customers to be patient. We're trying not to raise prices, but we're making sure that what is on the plate is still working within the parameters of our budget. But what's happening most is the things that we can control, we can control. There are things we can't control. How many people are going to walk in the door? How much COVID is going to hit? And what we can't control is our rent. And so rent has not come down at all, and that is what's difficult. So everybody's pretty much working for the landlord. I know that they are, they've lost lots of rent. DC's at 36 percent occupancy in their office buildings. Um, so we're all, as I said, we're all in it together. I'm looking for a win-win solution, and it's very, very difficult. So until then, I am spending as little money as I can as my, in my own personal life and at the restaurant without, without losing the quality of the service and the product that I'm giving to my customers. I love my customers. They've been great to me. We want to serve. We want to, we want to keep it rolling. So Riz, now I'm Riz, committed talk to, to that. Me. Riz, talk to me about that. I, I, I don't want you to gloss over that because, I mean, that's incredibly personal. So, so you're, you're cutting back in your personal life to keep your restaurant open. Absolutely. I work, I work uh, six hours a day, tw 10 hours, at least 10 hours, six hours a week, uh, six days a week, at least 10 hours a day. I take, I've taken on many more tasks that I would ordinarily hire people to do. Um, the good thing is that the people who are working for me are getting paid more, which, which blesses my heart. I love them dearly, and I'm happy to be able to do that. But I, I have committed myself to keeping my um, restaurant successful. And, and to keeping my customers happy and to keeping my staff employed. So that takes, you know, that takes a lot, a lot, a lot of supervision and a lot of just critical care. Um, and But I think everybody's in the same boat. Uh, mothers are in the same boat. Parents are in the same boat. Um, we, all have to fi we all have to figure out how to get through it. But as I said, you know, we, we, COVID stopped us all, got us all, all off of our treadmills, and we're going to get back on. Maybe it's a new treadmill. Um, and maybe it's not a treadmill. Maybe it's something different. But we, you know, experience tells us that we're going to get through this. Um, and so head down, everybody. Um, don't waste your money. Um, stay happy. It's tomato season. Have delicious tomato sandwiches for dinner. You know, you don't need more than that. I mean, there's nothing better in life than a tomato sandwich with on toast with mayonnaise. Riz Lacoste, we thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight and sharing. I know it's difficult, and we hope that your restaurant uh, can overcome this inflation and that inflation comes down. We will make it. Thank you so much, very much for having me. All right, Riz, you take care. Now to the growing outrage in Uvalde, Texas. Victims' families furious after the surveillance video from the school massacre was publicly leaked. The video coming days before the state intended to show it to the families first. NBC Sam Brock is in Texas tonight. Tonight, more fallout from that stunning video. Posted by the Austin American statesman, blindsided and devastating grieving families. It's like reliving that day all over again. And I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. I'm so tired. There is a video now out there in the world floating around on the internet for the remainder of my days and my children's days um, of their sister's last moments. That video shows law enforcement trying to reach the classroom minutes after the massacre started, only to retreat under a barrage of bullets and not even attempt to approach the classroom again for more than 40 minutes. 
That's when more shots ripped through the hallway. Ana Rodriguez's daughter, Maite, was killed. She hasn't been able to bring herself to watch the video. They failed our community. They failed our kids. Ultimately, a heavily armed Border Patrol team took down the gunman, an excruciating hour and 14 minutes after police first arrived. When you hear that timeline, even though you haven't seen it, what do you make of that? They're cowards. I understand you're being shot at. Okay, back away, regroup. What's plan B? Furious, furious, furious we are. Also fueling the community's uh, anger. That was the most chicken way to put this video out today. Is the statesman's decision to publish the video just days before the state was planning to release it to families and then the public. The paper writing, we have to bear witness to history and transparency and unrelenting reporting is a way to bring change. Who do you think you are to release footage like that of our children who can't even speak for themselves? But you want to go ahead and air their final moments to the entire world. To the person that leaked it. Screw you. Enough is enough. Now a city's enough anger turning into action. I was in the rock school shootout. People of all ages marching. So no one has to go through what I've gone through. I felt sad because most of my friends passed away. And questions only mounting. This memorial in the town center now almost bare once again. The crosses and flowers replaced by stuffed animals for the children no longer there to hold them. All right, Sam joins us now live from Uvalde tonight. Sam, can you walk us through any more about the decision to release the video by the Austin American statesman? We heard there clearly the family was incredibly upset. And it, no, it's not an easy decision for, for any news division to run that video and to show that to the public. Yeah, Tom, you know, it's interesting. We've had this conversation, the fact that there are newsrooms across America that weigh these kinds of decisions. They're just never on this scale. But that's the case here. The Austin American statesman decided that there was a compelling interest to the public in terms of arriving at the truth of the situation, that they had filed public records requests, that they had been stymied at every possible corner, back channels that had been tried, explored, and rejected, and that they had no other choice. The weird part about this is that the paper decided to post this video only four or five days before the State was going to release it to families and then release it to the public themselves. So the question would be, why now? Why not do this weeks ago? We were supposed to interview the reporter who broke the story for the statesman, and minutes before today, he couldn't do the interview because of breaking developments. So it's not clear exactly what that was, but we didn't get to ask him that question. And here we are right now with families looking at this video prematurely. But the reality, Tom, is the video would have come out one way or the other. Back to you. All right, Sam Brock for us over there in Uvalde. Sam, thank you. We want to head overseas now to the Middle East. President Biden touching down in Israel to begin his tour through the area. One of the stops, Saudi Arabia, where Biden is set to meet Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, a leader accused of ordering assassinations and crushing dissent. NBC News global correspondent Raf Sanchez is in Jerusalem for us tonight. Tonight, President Biden touching down in Israel, the start of his first trip to the Middle East since taking office. Smiles, fist bumps, and warm words with the new Israeli prime minister. But still to come for the president, a more difficult meeting with a leader whose kingdom he once condemned as a pariah. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, better known as MBS. The 36-year-old is the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia. But the CIA says he also ordered the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, sending a hit team to dismember him in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. MBS has always denied the allegation, but that didn't stop Biden slamming his government on the campaign trail. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. But now he's eager for Saudi help, saying previously he hopes they'll pump more oil so Europe can wean itself off Russian supplies and so American drivers will see some relief at the pump. The president insists that's not his main goal. I guess I will see the, the king and the crown prince, but that's, they, that's not the meeting I'm going to. They'll be part of a much larger meeting. But with the midterms looming, the political pressures are clear. MBS was once celebrated in Hollywood and Silicon Valley as a promising young reformer. That ended abruptly with Hashogji's murder. But a photograph with the U.S. president could help the prince and his country on a key priority, coming in from the diplomatic cold. Nothing is more important than just no longer being treated like some kind of sick pariah state 
that has a, a, a you know some kind of contagious disease. MBS has brought sweeping social reforms to his kingdom, including allowing men and women to mix at concerts and movie theaters. But the crown prince has also crushed dissent. Lujain al Hatloul, an activist who campaigned for women's right to drive, says she was imprisoned and tortured by Saudi authorities, a claim the government denies. Big picture, the crown prince is a tyrant, a modernizer, both. It's simply a reality that he has modernized it. It's also a reality that he's made Saudis fear for their lives, for their well, for their well-being, for the well-being of their families. His form of tyranny and his form of modernization are deeply intertwined. President Biden addressing criticism in a Washington Post op-ed, writing, I know there are many who disagree with my decision to travel to Saudi Arabia. My views on human rights are clear and long-standing, and fundamental freedoms are always on the agenda when I travel abroad. The White House says President Biden will be mostly avoiding handshakes for COVID reasons. That may help him avoid shaking the hand of the crown prince, a hand that's allegedly stained with blood. All right, Raf joins us now from Jerusalem. Raf, I know the White House is saying the president is avoiding shaking hands because of COVID, but he certainly did not avoid close contact today and even shaking hands with other people there in Israel. Yeah, Tom, as you know, President Biden is a very hands-on politician, and he only really lasted a couple of minutes before he started shaking hands. He shook hands with a lot of people, including Benjamin Netanyahu, the former Israeli prime minister, and two very elderly Holocaust survivors. And so if he refuses to shake MBS's hand on Friday, it's going to be very difficult for the White House to argue that that isn't a deliberate snub. Yeah, so I have to ask you about that, because that, that's why we bring this up, not, not for COVID protocols. It's because what's going to happen when he meets with the Saudis? Do we know what the meeting's going to look like with MBS and our president? We don't know what the meeting is going to look like. The Saudis are the hosts, so they will probably control the format. But we do know that the White House is just dreading the visual of President Biden shaking hands with the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. They really don't want that image of him up close and personal with a man accused of ordering the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Tom. Raf Sanchez for us tonight from Jerusalem. Raf, we thank you for that. We want to bring it back here to home where we have some new developing news when it comes to COVID. The latest concern, the BA5 variant, now the country's dominant strain. Experts saying the most transmissible form of COVID we've seen so far. NBC Stephen Romo is in New York for us tonight as the rates are going up here. Tonight, COVID cases are up as the BA5 variant spreads like wildfire. I'm not feeling so great. Experts call it the worst version of Omicron yet, now the dominant strain in the U.S., according to the CDC. It's not only more vaccine resistant, but it's also more highly transmissible than other versions of coronavirus. Experts now suggesting masking is still key especially with summer travel in full swing. What we know is that that's a, that is a place where the virus can spread. And that's why, especially in crowded airports, but uh, uh, on airplanes, I'm still wearing a mask. It's just a good way to protect yourself and, and to spot, uh, stop the spread to others. New daily cases in the U.S. are now up about fivefold since March, but that's still far lower than the peak of more than 800,000 new daily cases in January 2022. Dr. Anthony Fauci, who just had COVID himself, echoing the importance of being vigilant. When you're in an area where the infection dynamic is high, you should wear a mask in a congregate indoor setting. But opinions on masking still vary. I think it's a positive thing to bring back masks. I think it makes people a little bit more aware of themselves and keeping their germs to themselves. You know, I think everyone has a different view on it, me. I, b I believe in the man upstairs, to be quite honest with you. With the subvariant on the rise, some parents are jumping to get boosters for their kids under five. We plan to get ours vaccinated as soon as we can. But others are still hesitant, with the CDC reporting only 267,000 children under the age of five with a shot. I think I want to wait a little bit, maybe just six months to see how things are and getting vaccinated afterwards. In New York City, the hospitalization rate surging for the unvaccinated, according to the city health department, and more people flocking to testing sites. Some people are showing symptoms, about 50%. 
And uh, when they come by, some people are very surprised that they're positive. Uh, others have a scratchy throat, so their nasal congestion. I had a potential exposure last weekend. Sebastian Reyes needs a negative test to get back to his summer internship. I wasn't able to come into work like this whole past week. The CDC warning that many Americans are under vaccinated. Their message is clear. Staying up to date on your COVID-19 vaccines provides the best protection against severe outcomes. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now tonight from Times Square. Stephen, I know you were at a testing site earlier today. Were people getting tested because they were feeling sick or they were sort of feeling that they were finding more people in their social circles were, were catching COVID again? Well, for the most, most part, people we spoke to were getting tested because they had recently traveled. A lot of people were unclear on their symptoms if they were just feeling a bit sluggish. So just to be on the safe side, they would encounter one of these testing site tents that we see here in areas like Times Square just to be sure that they weren't carrying COVID with them right now. There is a lot of concern over that spreading subvariant, Tom. Yes, the most contagious so far. Stephen Romo for us tonight from Times Square. Stephen, thank you for that. Now to another growing crisis, this time over the rise in monkeypox cases. The the White House is defending what some are calling a sluggish response to the mon monkeypox outbreak in the wake of COVID. Experts are wondering if the U.S. public health system can handle another pandemic. Gabe Gutierrez has more. After weeks of long lines, tonight New York City is out of monkeypox vaccine appointments again as cases double here every six days. Local officials sending a letter to the Biden administration urgently asking for more doses. It's because of New York City that we're even having this conversation about a national vaccination strategy. The White House says the FDA is inspecting more shots from a manufacturer in Denmark. Do we wish we had more doses out there right now? Of course. Um, but, the, but we had a stockpile and what we need is we need more and we're getting more. New York City accounts for about a fifth of the now more than 800 reported cases to the CDC this year across 39 states. While anyone can get monkeypox, most of the infections so far have been in the LGBTQ community. I'm urging everyone to take this seriously. Matt Ford in Los Angeles says he got monkeypox last month through skin-to-skin -skin contact. In addition to lesions throughout his body, he endured intense flu-like symptoms. You know, it got to the point where I couldn't sleep at night. Some experts are questioning whether the U.S. public health system has been sluggish and what that could mean for future pandemics. The monkeypox experience is telling us that we really should be on a red threat level of alert because we have not learned these lessons. Gabe Gutierrez joins us now in studio. Gabe, on monkeypox, it is spreading like wildfire. You pointed that out in your report, but it's not necessarily killing a ton of people. Yeah, that's right, Tom. The WHO says there's just been really a handful of deaths so far across the globe. Here in the U.S., though, more than 800 confirmed cases, and I just, as I just reported, cases are doubling here in New York City about every six days. Yeah, that's, that's wild. A reminder, viewers, how exactly does this spread? Well, health experts say that it is spread through prolonged skin to skin contact and they stress that while anyone can get it so far the majority of cases has been in the lgbtq community largely spread uh, through sexual activity all right gabe gutierrez gabe thank you for that when we come back the urgent manhunt the search for the suspect behind a string of deadly armed robberies at 7-elevens in california the massive reward now being offered by the company plus the man turning the tables on would-be robbers the moment he wrestled away a gun while on the ground what happened next and the latest on that raging wildfire in yosemite what officials believe is the cause stay with us All right, we're back now with an urgent manhunt in Southern California. Police still searching for a man involved in a string of deadly robberies at multiple 7-Eleven stores. The company now offering a huge reward for information as they were forced to close some of their locations for a second night. Guad Venegas tonight with more. Police in Southern California continue an all-out manhunt for a suspect allegedly involved in four shootings, two of them fatal. 7-Eleven recommends its Los Angeles area stores close for a second night last night, a precaution after the suspect targeted the stores on July 11th or 7-Eleven. In all, six 7-Elevens in the area were robbed, authorities linking one man to at least four of them. In Riverside, just before 2 a.m. Monday morning, police say the suspect allegedly entered the store, robbed a clerk, and shot a man in the head before fleeing. 
That victim, 46-year-old Jason Harrell, is in the hospital fighting for his life, his family says. We fully expect him to fight through this whole thing and, and win this battle. Authorities say the other three robberies and shootings took place in Santa Ana, Brea, and La Habra from 3.20 a.m. to 4.55 a.m. The victim in the Santa Ana shooting... 24-year-old Matthew Rule was found in the parking lot outside the 7-Eleven NBC Los Angeles reporting that Rule was shot once in the upper body and pronounced dead at the scene. At first, it wasn't clear if they were related. At this point, we can't confirm whether or not they're connected. But then detectives linked the suspect to the other shootings after seeing a security camera photo released by authorities in Brea showing a man wearing a black sweatshirt with the hood pulled over his head. In that shooting, officers responded after 4 a.m. to a report of an employee who had been shot. Police said they pronounced him dead on scene. The victim's girlfriend telling NBC Los Angeles that the clerk, Matthew Hirsch, was the love of her life. There's no sense. Even if they took things, like, it wasn't worth what they took from me. Less than four miles away in La Habra, police believe the suspect robbed another 7-Eleven and shot two people, a customer and another longtime clerk known as Manny. He was robbed. And he was shot. The family telling KNBC that both Manny and that customer are side by side at the hospital in stable condition. July 11th is 7-Eleven's anniversary and the company celebrates with free Slurpees nationwide. Police say they aren't sure if there's a link between the crimes and the date. 7-Eleven releasing a statement reading in part. Our hearts are with the victims and their loved ones. We are gathering information on this terrible tragedy and working with local law enforcement. All right, Guad Venegas joins us now live from Los Angeles. Squad, this is pretty incredible. 7-Eleven is now offering a $100,000 reward for information that leads to the arrest of that suspect. Uh, Tom, that is correct. That's a very large reward. So the public is being asked to contact Orange County Sheriff's Department's Crime Stopper line with any information that might lead to an arrest. Now, I should also add that there were two other robberies in Southern California uh, that took place. Now, authorities don't know if these two robberies are connected to the other four. So in total, we had six robberies across three different uh, counties. And we know that there is that one suspect that, as you mentioned, authorities uh, are offering or seven left is offering through the authorities a $100,000 reward for any information that might lead to his capture. Tom? Yeah, we could be talking about a one-man crime spree. Guad, thank you for that. Crime also impacting another major U.S. chain. Starbucks has announced it is closing some stores across the country because of crime and safety concerns. Miguel Almaguer has this story. It's one of the nation's most iconic brands, and now in some of the country's biggest cities, Starbucks will close stores. Though it's only 16 locations, in regions like Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, and Washington, D.C., the closures are making headlines because the coffee giant is citing safety concerns. We have to provide a self safe environment for our people and our, and our customers. And men, the, the mental health crisis in the country is, is severe, acute, and getting worse. Starbucks now telling employees it'll offer additional safety training to de-escalate situations and could close restrooms. Of the 16 stores the company is closing, at least two recently unionized. Starbucks says that didn't play a role in their decision, but some employees and even the LAPD police chief have criticized store closures. I'm disappointed to see uh, Starbucks, or for that matter, any uh, commercial engagement uh, give up. But Starbucks is hardly alone. After brazen thieves ransacked local retailers in San Francisco, Walgreens and Safeway closed stores or adjusted hours. It's a scary situation, a scary time. Tonight, for some retailers, the cost of doing business is far too high. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. All right, when we come back, the shark warning, a surfer bitten off the coast of Long Island. It's the area's fourth attack in weeks. What experts say could be driving the surge. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with another shark attack off the coast of New York's Long Island. Authorities say a 41-year-old surfer was bitten in the leg by a suspected
tiger shark. The man reportedly punching the shark in the face and swimming to shore, he was taken to the hospital. No word yet on his condition. It's the fourth shark attack off the coast of Long Island just this month. Experts say they're on the rise due to several factors, including warming waters. All right, the search for two suspects after a gun battle that was caught on camera in Philadelphia. New video capturing the moment a man fights off a would-be robber in broad daylight. You see it right there. A second suspect then approaches with a gun drawn and fires. The victim then managed to wrestle a gun away from his first attacker, shooting the second. Both suspects took off. The victim was shot but is expected to survive. Now to the latest on the wildfire in Yosemite National Park. The park superintendent saying they believe the fire was caused by humans because there was no lightning on the day it started. The fire has burned more than 3,400 acres and flames continue to close in on hundreds of the park's historic sequoia trees. LeBron James is clarifying his comments about Brittany Griner's detainment in Russia. In a trailer for his TV show, James criticized the U.S. effort to free Brittany Griner, saying, quote, how can she feel like America has her back, even saying he would have doubts about wanting to return to the U.S.? After backlash and a lot of it, James tweeted he wasn't trying to disrespect America, but was simply sympathizing with Griner, adding hashtag bring her home. All right, and Brittany Griner's trial continues tomorrow in Russia. And perhaps no one else in the world understands quite what she's going through, like a young American whose story is very, very similar. Nama Eisutcher has never spoken publicly about her detainment in Russia, but she spoke exclusively about it with our Kate Snow. Are you speaking out right now in part because you hope Brittany Griner hears you and feels your camaraderie? That's, that's probably the biggest reason that I'm here. Nama Isacher grew up in New Jersey and moved to Israel as a teen. In 2019, she backpacked through India and had a layover in Moscow on her way home. She says she was pulled from the boarding line, taken to a room where authorities searched her checked backpack and found a third of an ounce of cannabis. I was like... Where did that come from? There was no point that I was like, oh, no, they found it. Like, I didn't know it was in my bag. She was charged with possession and later trafficking. Over the next 10 months, Isacher was held in cells with up to 40 other women. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? Steel. It's loud. They don't provide you with anything besides food. They don't provide you with toilet paper or feminine, you know, hygiene products. Her mother would bring her supplies and was allowed to visit only a few times. When she went to trial, she was in a facility believed to be the same one Brittany Griner is in now. One hour a day, they were taken to a cell with an open-air roof. So you're looking up and you can see blue sky? Yeah, or gray. There's no walking around outdoors? No, There's you no walk exercise. around in circles in that small cell. She taught herself Russian and kept a journal. And I would see all the optimistic things that I wrote inside. I'm like, oh, see, it's not that bad. You know, it can't be that bad. As a former sniper in the Israeli army, she says she wasn't scared and was never abused. Isaacer heard talk she might be part of a prisoner exchange for a Russian who was jailed in Israel. She was sentenced to seven and a half years. My thought was like, oh, what a lie. Like, what a lie. Like, I'm not going to be here for seven and a half years. Why did you think that? I knew that it made... No sense whatsoever. I knew that this was a complete game. I've seen that judge many times at that point, and I knew that he was being told to say things. You think the Russian government was telling them what to do? I think so. Looking back on it now, do you think you were yes. a political pawn? Yes. Yes. Hands down. In January of 2020, Vladimir Putin traveled to Israel and met Isacher's mother. Shortly after, he issued a pardon. What would you say to Brittany Griner if you could speak to her? Try to smile. It helps, even if it seems like it doesn't. It really helps, mostly for herself. I think there's so much power in what we train our minds to think. You're praying for her? Oh, always. Isacher told me that it was really difficult two years ago transitioning out of prison and back to regular life. She had become really famous, well-known in Israel, and the paparazzi was hounding her. People were chasing her down. She didn't want that kind of attention as a very private person. She's moved to New York since. She said that she's wrestled with and, and processed a lot of emotions and now is feeling a lot better. She's working in a music venue here in New York and has dreams of one one day opening a hotel as also, as you might expect, writing a book.
Tom. Okay, Kate, we thank you for that, and we'll have much more of Brittany Griner's trial tomorrow on tomorrow's broadcast. Coming up, news from Hollywood. Yellowstone shut out. The hit series is filled with legendary actors and also has several spinoffs. So what happened? Why did it get no Emmy nominations? We'll speak to an expert in this field coming up right after this break. Stay with us. I want to bring in NPR TV critic Eric Deggins. Eric, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. So like we saw in that piece, Yellowstone is the most popular scripted series out there right now, but it did not receive a single nomination. The show's star, of course, actor Kevin Costner, he's won two Academy Awards, I think two Golden Globes, even a primetime Emmy, I'm being told. And the director, Taylor Sheridan, has also been nominated for awards in the past. So what do you think happened here? How big of a deal was this snub? Well, I'm going to I'm going to advance a radical theory here, which is that Yellowstone is not as good as all the other shows that got nominated for best drama. Unfortunately, I know a lot of people like the show, but you know, if you were to look at the ratings in general for scripted shows, you would see shows like NCIS, for example, at the top of the ratings, and that doesn't mean that it's a high quality show as far as the Emmy Academy is concerned. That show uh, doesn't get nominated as best drama or get any acting nominations either. Eric. So Eric, but also, but I will say, isn't necessarily an indicator. Of I, I agree. No, you're right. It could be a bad show, but it's the most popular show in America right now. Scripted show shows uh, shows like The Sopranos, Glee, Friends were all incredibly popular, and they also won Emmys. So, do you do you think the snub has hey. to do with the content, or do you think there's something more at play? Well, I think there's an incredible amount of competition in the TV industry right now, and I think Yellowstone is essentially a, uh, a, 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 an elevated family drama. It's a, it's a soap opera, in a way, um, that's, that's presented in a more textured and, and, and a little more sophisticated way. It doesn't hold up <laughs> to the, 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 uh, the other shows that got nominated, Better Call Saul, for example, I think is, is, is the best show on television. Euphoria, Ozark, Severance, Squid Game. These were shows that are uh, not just high quality, uh, but, they, but they take chances in terms of the way they tell stories and the, and the stories that they're telling. Yellowstone is, is not that. And, and I know that some people may want to read some sort of political, um, you know, dimension to what happened, uh, because it's a show that appeals to a more, a, you know, rural demographic, maybe. It's a show that, um, you know, isn't as, you know, liberally friendly as maybe some other shows. Maybe people will say that. I, I don't really think that's what, what's going on here. Eric, I totally um, agree with and you. And in that fact, I, if I... If, if, yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. Well, it, is, it is not euphor euphoria. It's not succession. It's not Better Call Saul. It, it, it's none exactly. of those. It is, it is not cutting edge at all. It, it, it is nothing new. I will say they may have taken a risk by, by putting out a genre and investing a lot of money in it. I mean, these, these aren't cheap shoots uh, of a genre that you could argue has been dead for, for decades. And, and, and finding out it's incredibly popular. I want to read you something from one of your colleagues. This is Lynette Rice. She writes for Deadline, and this is what she writes in her article, in part. After four seasons on Paramount, Yellowstone has only earned one Emmy nod for outstanding production design for a narrative contemporary program in 2021. It was completely ignored this year, even though Kelly Riley's star continues to rise for her portrayal of the volcanic Beth Dutton. Voters may continue to see the Kevin Costner drama as a red state western, a show about the other part of America that only your dad watches. Is that fair? Well, that's what Annette thinks. I, I have to say again, you know, I've been keeping an eye on the show uh, because I know how popular it is. And, and just as from my standpoint as a critic, I don't feel that it stacks up to these other shows that we've been uh, talking about. Uh, and in fact, I was more concerned that another show that was created by the creator of Yellowstone, uh, 1883, a, a, a show um, that, uh, that um, you know, was a spinoff. I thought that was a better made show, and I thought that was a show that actually deserved nominations more than Yellowstone, and I was disappointed not to see that show. Real quick, since, since you like the sequel, they're going to make a prequel now, the, the, the same creators starring Harrison Ford and, and Helen Mirren. What, what's your prediction for that series? 
Uh, well, I, I'm certainly looking forward to it. Um, now, the show that I was talking about is also a prequel. It takes place in 1883. So the show that they're talking about doing is a show that would actually fall in between 1883 and Yellowstone. It would tell the story from the 20s or the 30s. And, and, and basically what we're seeing is the Dutton family kind of evolve. We're seeing how they came to own all the land that they owned and how the family came to be the way that it is. And that's a, that's a compelling story. And I, I think Yellowstone fans are really going to love it. And the fact that they have stars of such high caliber starring in this, in this uh, series tells you that the scripts are probably going to be good. They're going to spend a lot of money on production. And, and this show uh, may be more likely to get an Emmy nomination than either of the other two we've been talking about. All right. And if they don't, you know who we're calling, Eric. We'll have you right back on here. Eric Deggins from uh, NPR. Eric, thank you so morning. much. Yeah, when we come back, it's an end of the year tradition, signing yearbooks at school. So what happens when no one wants to sign your yearbook? When we come back, a story that's going to touch your heart and also make you love the actor Paul Rudd even more. Stay with us. Finally tonight, when one sixth grader didn't get the end of the year send off he wanted, his mom, a group of high schoolers, and even an Avenger all stepped in to help the kind messages and the mementos he'll cherish for years to come. Getting your yearbook signed just before summer break is a rite of passage so many students look forward to. I just knew that something was wrong and I knew earlier that day they had gotten their yearbooks. That's why sixth grader Brody Ritter from Westminster, Colorado was so crushed when he only got a few signatures. It, it broke my heart. Brody signing his own yearbook, writing to himself, hope you make some more friends. Mom Cassandra sharing that message on a school Facebook group with the caption, my heart is shattered, teach your kids kindness. So I decided to post that mostly because I wanted parents to talk to their kids about bullying. I don't want children to feel that way. That post striking a nerve with other parents. Then the very next day, waves of high school students lining up to sign Brody's yearbook, filling the pages with messages for their new friend. I just knew right away, mom, you posted something. And soon, students from all across the country sending their signatures in the mail with words of encouragement like, you seem so nice and like such a good person. And if I was in your class, I wouldn't ever think of not signing your yearbook. Hey, Brody. Hey, Brody. Hi, Brody. Hi, Brody. Hi, Brody. Hi, Brody. Hi, Brody. The cast of Broadway's Dear Evan Hansen even inviting him to New York. Will you bring your yearbook? Because we all want to sign it. And perhaps the coolest surprise of all. I heard about you. And I'm like, I gotta talk to this kid. A special call from one of the Avengers, Ant-Man himself, Paul Rudd. I'm very excited that uh, I get to talk to you, that I get to meet you. I'm Ant-Man. Ant-Man. What, you haven't heard of me? The superhero who proved even the smallest people can make the biggest difference, sending Brody his own helmet for when he, quote, takes on the world. The two now texting buddies. Brody writing, you're my favorite superhero. Rudd writing back, you're mine. I just feel so much love and excitement for Brody because he said he's actually excited to go back to school next year, which I've never heard him say anything like that before. He's excited for what the future holds. I have a feeling Brody Ritter is going to need a few more yearbooks with all of his new friends. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.